close to protocol will in fact scare the pants off of all of us. There will be no more pants. What is fear? Fear is such a basic part of who we are. Where is it created? Atmosphere in a game like this is everything. It's terrifying, but it's beautiful. And how can we use it? With horror, there's no rules. Glenn Schofield and the developers of the Callisto Protocol invite you to join them and some very special icons of horror. I think it goes back to the earliest times around a campfire. The perfect horror experience is something that, that scares the piss out of me. Think of it as a roller coaster. I want it to make me feel things. I want it to startle me. They're all magic tricks. That's what we're doing in the movies. As they discuss crafting the perfect horror experience. <laughs> The five tenets of horror for the Callisto Protocol are brutality, atmosphere, tension, helplessness, and humanity. The Callisto Protocol is mastering horror. Brutality is part of that, oh, that shock value. And shock is just one of the emotions of horror, right? And so I kind of look for those to affect people a little bit. What we wanted the project to be was really about looking at films and games and kind of thinking about how we wanted our project to sit within those. You know, we watch these movies and it does give you a feeling. It was a lot of fun because there was a lot of research. <laughs> when you sit down on the couch or go to the movie theater to watch a movie, you're experiencing someone else's story and you can feel things by experiencing that story and, and it can be very moving, but there is always going to be a distance between you and that character. One of the things that video games does that I think heightens things for storytelling purposes is it puts you in the center of that story. So you are the one performing tasks. You are the one succeeding when the character succeeds. I think the growth in that is exponential. I mean, I think it's gonna be massive, um, even from where it is now. Whoever the next George Lucas is, he, she, they, at 13 years old, they have a controller in their hands. It's an experience that is unrivaled in other forms of entertainment. There are two movies, um, Hostel and Martyrs, in which there was a scene in each one that were so brutal that it affected me. Like for a couple of weeks, I'm like, oh, gee, you know, just thinking about it, I'm like, man, that was, that was really brutal. The concept of brutality is, well, it's certainly useful. Brutality is a very specific kind of trauma. It is usually senseless. It usually has a visceral, almost excessive amount of violence to it. They don't pull punches at all in this game. And I was like, whoa, Glenn, Scott, Chris, you guys are crazy. We wanted to get to something that felt very raw, very real for the player. And, and that's a fantastic tool for, for really sort of cutting through the noise in some respects, for connecting with people and evoking that kind of almost like lizard brain reaction of terror and fear to what's happening on screen. You know, conflict is drama and physical conflict, AKA brutality, is the most primal form of, of conflict. And it's something that everyone can understand. You have to be very, very careful with it. You know, you see somebody come along and chop somebody else's head off, like, like Tom Savini did in, in uh, Friday the 13th. Well, that had never been done before. It became like a magic trick. You say, how do they do that? But it's gone. And, and, and then you go forward. I do the same thing a magician does. A magician, 
uh, is trying to make you believe that what you're seeing is really happening. Well, that's what we're doing in the movies. We do have a lot of parts coming off and dismemberment and all of that. We have bones showing up, but it's not like, oh, this game is about showing the bones. No, I think it's about the combination. This is really about survivorship. I've got a bone up. I actually have to match that level of violence. I have to become offensive. It also so crosses a line from civilized behavior that it lets you know that in this story, this is the world we are in now. You know, you really have to put your characters through the ringer in horror. If you have a guy trying to get from point A to point B, you know, that's a story. You can have conflicts happen along the way. Uh, if he's got a broken leg and his bones hanging out, the story's about 10 times more interesting, to me at least. <laughs> I'm just trying to give you a chance at rebirth. In creature design, no matter how fanciful, if you have one toe in reality, maybe, you're going to fare better than if you are doing something that is a complete flight of fantasy. You know, biophage didn't just happen. It took a lot of like nuances and drawings and sketches and 3D pieces and, and stuff like that. And then I realized personally, the thing that scares me the most is a deranged human. When you make a character that is two arms, two legs, a head, two eyes, you're building familiarity into it. Does that make it more or less scary? There is something a lot more terrifying about being able to look at a creature, seeing that there is a human relatable side, right? That could be me. You have to come up with the style and, and what are these creatures? What are the roots of these creatures? Are they aliens? Is it uh, something biological? Is it something that's evolved? You know, you have to kind of set down those roots first. We want to ground everything we do, so we want people to believe on what they see, and that kind of breaks the barrier on thinking that, that it's just another game or just like a, something created. Glauco's amazing, not just his creative eye, but also just, you know, his mind and the way that he has taken the human form and 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 turned it on its ear, kind of giving you this this kind of twisted humanity vibe with bones growing out and teeth growing out and eyes turning into something different. My favorite, uh, which I had a, I played a huge role in that one personally. I had a lot of fun sculpting. Is Big Mouth is the guy that we see in the first trailer, and we see it a couple of times in the other demos too. He has a really big mouth, <laughs> and he has like very long teeth, and you know, there's a lot of saliva and like goo like coming out of his mouth. I don't know how many versions we did of him. Well, not in 3D, but we probably have about 50 different designs of him. Yeah, that one is my favorite, maybe for bias reasons, but. <laughs> We wanted a two head that was split in half right from the very beginning and, and those are still there. There are some other ones that we haven't revealed yet that are really, really exciting too. That I can't wait for the players to see. Our combat experience is really getting close to these creatures and we show full detail. We don't hold anything back. A lot of it was picking melee as the 50% of our gameplay. You are very close to enemies. You're always within reach of them and so you're in danger. That also is a way to show the brutality right in front center stage. Uh, so as we're doing these melee hits, you're seeing that reaction. Our camera's close up to the enemy, to you. So you see the arm pop off, you see the blood. <laughs> Our guard system plays a big role in showcasing brutality. It's basically a system that scales through enemies, through environmental hazards, and basically allows the enemies to get dismembered, to spawn blood, to have the deaths. Like if I hit someone, 
with a bat, stun baton. How's that arm gonna fall? If I shoot him in the head, like, is it going to explode? We have a lot of tools built into the system that we can, you know, achieve all of these different things. Oh, shit! That's the direction that we wanted to take. Uh, so in that vein, uh, we just uh, went to the supermarket and we were buying a bunch of uh, different types of meat. Uh, something with uh, more fresh, more red, uh, something with more fascia. Fascia is the, is the tissue that covers muscles. We've worked very closely with Jorge throughout the process. He's so passionate. What he did was he bought a light box and then he put the chicken breast on the light box and it's actually measuring lighting values, physical value values from it. We bring the meat into, into here, uh, into the studio. Uh, we place them on a light rig and we just uh, make the lights spin. And we basically have uh, an image for every single light direction. And that allows us to understand how this tissue is reacting to light. So we can understand uh, how to actually replicate that in the game. His passion and dedication, I have not seen anywhere else. So we went to actually pierce our, our finger a little bit to get some blood, uh, blood in there. And then we actually recorded how the blood will change over time to understand all the range of colors that blood can have from very fresh to, you know, how it looks like after 45, one hour. Uh, and we have that, uh, we made that available for artists as reference. Jorge has definitely pushed a lot of boundaries when it comes to, you know, fidelity and, and visual improvements. He is uh, a spectacular engineer. The dodge system is uh, very important to our game because it really separates us from a lot of other games in the horror genre. What that is, is if you hold left on the left stick while an enemy is attacking, you will dodge their attack. And if they come back again and hit you again, you have to hit right. If you don't have the rhythm right, th then you will get hit. The other thing it allows us is our AI is uh, relentless. They will not stop coming for you. So if you shot them in the leg, you blew off both their legs. Well, that doesn't mean they're dead. Now they're crawling at you. And if they're crawling coming at you, if you can't shoot them, well, hit them on top of the head. Boom. So we are building this world like full of fear, full of horror and then when you fight an enemy you get a satisfaction of like ripping off the enemy's head it's just really trying to enhance that they are very brutal with you you can be brutal with them but they will be brutal back it shows consequence right you, you don't only see the threat you can really understand what's going to happen if that's going to be reaching to you and it's going to be defeating you. And that's where we have a lot of fun because we want the player to feel like, oh man, like, did I just die like that? Like, oh, this is horrible. And like, this is so disgusting. We've got some real cool death scenes uh, for Jacob, really special. <laughs> It's really about seeing what happens to us when we lose against creatures. We show every single detail and that, that's, that's what really drives uh, that experience for us. Most games don't reward you for dying. They just give you a nice, you are dead and then take you back. Now we want to even reward you for dying. Uh, we, we think that's, that's fun to do. It's a little bit of light relief in a failure moment. And uh, we think they're very kind of collectible. Uh, from, from the player point of view as well. I'm looking forward to the YouTube video supercut of all of our deaths, because I'm looking forward to that, because I don't think I've seen them all back to back and just yeah. looking forward to that video. One more. We want to be scared shitless without suffering the negative consequences of it in reality. Our mind wants to understand the world in a greater sense without putting our bodies in, in, in danger. We handle it better when we can find significance. We can find meaning in it. And good storytelling will help us find that purpose in really straightforward ways. Characters striving to succeed against all odds. I mean, that's really the, the secret sauce of storytelling. And horror does that, I think, better than almost any genre. And brutality is a huge element to that.
the tension in the game is key. Well, when you think about horror, you know, it's not just sort of an endless series of jump scares one after another. Tension is built in the moments where you know something is coming, but you don't quite know what it will be and where it will come from. And then that release, whether it's a scare or not, right? You have to be on your edge of your seat because you, know, you never know, uh, are, are we gonna scare you then? Players want to have moments of success. Players want to have moments where that tempo is changing. So that adds to the tension, it adds to the suspense, it adds to the unknown. It's about blowing air into the balloon, making it bigger and bigger. So when there's finally that moment of release, that burst of horror, the jump scare, we get as sort of big a reaction as possible from the player. That kind of tension building is uh, similar to film and TV. If you can, you know, work on the anticipation of the audience, if you can play their anticipation against them, that's another way to, to build suspense and to make things, you know, more terrifying. Most people want to avoid or get out of a feeling that's so intense and dreadful. In fact, our natural response when we feel an intense negative emotion is to find a way out of it, make it stop. Those of us who are willing to tolerate that peak are actually kind of more emotionally intelligent when we know eventually that's going to dip out. And those folks that interact with the game for prolonged periods of time are better able to be in control of emotions during that tension. So atmosphere in a game like this is uh, everything. Atmosphere and mood is very, very important to the success of, of horror, to, to building suspense and to set the stage for what's coming. It's so critical to kind of creating that experience, that sort of visceral sort of emotional reaction. Alien, the spaceship. You know, you're a gazillion miles from home, and if you believe what's going on, you're with them a gazillion miles at home. To me, that movie is one of the best examples of atmosphere. You're treated to a lot of cool visuals of the environment, and you know, you get to know this workaday world of these, you know, space truckers and, and what their spaceship looks like, et cetera. What does atmosphere mean? It means lighting. It means the space we're in. Is it wide open? Is it tight and claustrophobic? What are the sounds we're hearing? The atmosphere almost informs you of what can happen to you, what will happen to you, what is the overall attitude in the place that you're in. So when we think about sort of our environments, the mood, the atmosphere, it's all about building that tension. I think that what we're talking about is vulnerable people and a place where there is a great deal of jeopardy which they may or may not know about. So what happened to the original colony? The big word for atmosphere, I think, is immersion. I want to feel getting spooked while looking over my shoulder. I want all of that. I love it all. I think that's the beauty of, of, of the whole gaming world, is that you are truly immersed and you sort of control your own destiny. And this one is, I mean, the guys that made it, I was like, are you okay, man? How did you think of that? And, and and what went through you, like, what was your creative process to think of that? That is unbelievably scary. The design of the prison and the overall planet and just the environment is a pretty, it's a pretty deep process. We probably put half of our resource just on environment design into getting the right atmosphere. starts with our concept team. 
you know, we'll throw kind of just a bunch of general ideas at them, like what does gem pop look like? What does solitary look like? What does the surface of Callisto look like? I think of design as like a pyramid where you lay down a big foundation of lots of different ideas where you try to be as disparate as possible with what you're showing so that the director can go, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't, ooh, but I like that, I like that. And then that moves up to the next level, which is a, which is a, you know, a smaller platform. And then you keep going, you keep going until you arrive at that thing at the top. In the beginning, it was mostly just the environment artists and the concept artists talking together. And we would go back and forth of, oh, this would look better. Or how about this? What about this color scheme? And those guys, they're so creative. You know, they find these great references and then they'll kind of take those references and just turn them into something you can't even believe. You set up a mood with someone else that's like really good at architecture, comes in and do some amazing designs. And then we can like take that further, getting different moods, different pieces. It's, it's a lot of back and forth between different concept artists, and I get to learn a lot from, from them as well. Certainly, I think we did our fair share of research. So we have influences, uh, Cameron, we have uh, Kubrick, we have uh, Ridley Scott. Our art director, Demetrius, and I spent a lot of time like finding imagery and stuff that we would kind of throw their way. Like, hey, you know, we're thinking uh, we need some sort of a futurized uh, panopticon area inside the prison, or we need to, to futurize like what does solitary look like? Like we want it to be darker. We want it to be more brutal feeling, just something that is just terrifying to walk through. We want to make you afraid of opening every door. You know, why are all the cells empty? You know, that sort of thing, right? We want you to, to think a little bit as well, right? When we were doing the research, uh, some of the stuff became self-evidence. When we were designing the creatures, uh, mutation was uh, something that we were putting forth. And then we were designing the environments to match that. We thought, oh, what matches mutation? Oh, uh, what's a technology that matches mutation? There's something called generative design that's for taking man-made objects, throwing it through AI, and it mutates it into a new design. But what comes out, looks very alien and not man-made at all. So it was a perfect match for what we were doing with the creatures. And so we'll go through a few revs of kind of like designing what the lighting scheme would be like, what the color scheme would be like. They didn't have a clue what was going on. Things are changing. To come up with a color palette, we actually go, went through mm -hmm. the uh, psychology of the color, uh, emotion of the colors as well as to actually referencing a lot of movie, horror movies, sci-fi horror movies. Yeah, the emotional color is an interesting thing. You know, I didn't really think about it before. And, you know, working with lighting and, and the team, they sort of introduced, like, you know, we watch these movies and they put colors into scenes that we don't really think about. One of our areas is a very kind of wet processing area. And so we deliberately use greens and yellows and browns in those because they are colors with, which emphasize disgust. And so we want the disgust to come through as the underlying fear element in those areas. And we play around with color space theory all the time through our very sophisticated lighting system. Combining that with us trying to tell the story of what's happening in each one of these spaces using materials, using bloody handprints, following a trail to like someone who's lying there on the floor. Combining that with the color theory, it, uh, you know, it provides a very impactful experience, I think. Asim, our, our environment director, you know, he has guided our environment team in building these these great spaces that not only are just beautifully horrific, but also really compelling and really fun play spaces that you can travel through and, and want to explore and want to, to understand by looking at your environment, what happened here. There's a lot of different ways to go about it, right? High contrast, dark areas, gross spaces that you don't want to be in, right? Makes you uncomfortable and lots of blood. <laughs> Each space should make you feel a certain type of way. So going along with, okay, how do we make the player feel isolated? Well, that's gonna be a totally different kind of feel. It's gonna be made out of different material. It's gonna sound different when you walk around it. Or how do we make the player feel trapped? That's gonna be another kind of environment. So it's going off of what we kind of know and then making it fit into kind of that world and how we wanna make the 
player kind of feel in that moment. Confusion is an important part of horror. And uh, providing information, maybe misinformation, or taking away information, or making information abstract. Uh, and we can ramp that up or uh, dial it back. I mean, if it was brightly lit, you feel safe, you know? You're like in a hospital, everything is white and sanitary. But in the darkened basement, you can't see, even peripherally, what might be coming up at you. One part of tension is what's around the corner. Uh, a lot of times we're designing very claustrophobic places in concept. We kind of are ca casting shadows that could possibly look like some monster hiding around the corner. Glenn wanted to create different entryways for the monsters to come out. I think that's why it's really good that this is a third person thing. You know, you need to have a sense that there is a back and you can't see what's behind you or what's beyond the frame to the right or the left. It's not just gonna be, you know, one door opens and they're right there. It's coming out from different um, vents and pipes and uh, sometimes you hear something in the background and you don't notice it, but then you do as the audience member. In the 50s and 60s, there was a filmmaker by the name of William Castle, and he understood that enhancing shock and fear could be more fun. I love William Castle. I'm very attracted to those kinds of um, larger-than-life personalities, people who are, you know, they, they may be doing something cheesy and, you know, low art, but um, they're pushing the envelope there. He developed this thing called a Percepto buzzer he would have these buzzers in seats go off while the movie was playing, probably during points of tension. This was essentially shocking moviegoers, but it was also very exciting for them. The new PlayStation controller is amazing, right? I mean, it's the, the combination of being able to feel your heartbeat and the, and the footsteps and everything around you. And so that puts it right in your lap, in your hands. And so we've been able to amplify everything the same way with the buzzers under the seats. We can buzz you. And on the flip side, on some of the kind of body gore stuff, we can feel a bone breaking when you lop it off and stuff. And it's that type of stuff that makes you kind of winch a little bit. It's, it's really satisfying. But then being able to have the speaker built into that controller as well, it kind of gives you a whole new tool in your toolbox. You know, like what it, you could be walking down a hallway and hear whispering and be like, well, where's that coming from, right? And it just kind of trickles out of that speaker. You know, be able to kind of use that to build atmosphere and tension. It's like a kid in the candy store with stuff like that for, for a game like this. Using elements of sound in order to create fear is, I think, brilliant. You know, not just the sounds of the creatures, which are terrifying on their own right, but the sounds of the environment and the music and, and the part that that plays. Cameron told me that, that he felt that 40% of the visual impact of any given shot or image is sound. And that's a substantial proportion. Audio plays a huge role in this uh, in supporting what otherwise is just an empty hallway. And the ability to engineer horror is a lot easier in my opinion. You know, being able to walk down a hall and just hear something, even if you can't see it, hear something walking or hear something fall or hear something scratching and not knowing what's gonna happen. Those are the type of things that, that can send a, a shiver down your spine without having to see anything at all. I gotta say, Glenn spends an amazing amount of time focused on the audio. The music to me is 80% of the audio. You've got to have this music in which you're tense. Making people feel scared is kind of like what we're hired to do on this, right guys?
we've done a lot of things with our apprehension engine. The apprehension engine is something that Hollywood has used. It's brand new. It's this crazy invention, right? It's a weird looking thing and it's got metal on it and strings and stuff. And the sounds it makes are just awful. There are only a handful of them built, and it's got a variety of things that you can do with it. For me, the apprehension engine is, it's like a chaos playground. got sort of this core box and there's kind of a three string kind of cello component. The most basic thing is it's got a, a reverb spring in it. You can just flick it with your finger like this and make the loudest noise you have ever heard. It's so disturbing. It's in Dr. Sleep actually several times. It comes with a little bow and with that you know there's like these rulers that it has and each one is a different length so you can get different pitches and bend the rulers as if that wasn't enough. <laughs> then it's got a, basically a hurdy-gurdy built into it, and the hurdy-gurdy can be played either with a slide or you can play individual notes. I think I watched YouTube videos to figure out how to even put it together because the instruction manual is really minimal. And once you start playing it, you realize you're like, oh, well, it's, it's just going to tell you what, you know, you're going to just react with it and there's no like right way to play it. And I think it's, it made so much more sense after spending some time with it. It's like. Of course, yeah, it's just like whatever you, you know, put into it, it's going to sort of give you that kind of like weird tension vibe energy back and it's just going to create this kind of like feedback loop of hellscape sounds <laughs> that come out of it. I'm sure this has been done, but I feel like someone needs to do like a Hollywood Bowl show where it's just like one <laughs> individual up there and it's just you know act one is you know beautiful sounds because you can get some interestingly beautiful sounds haunting. and rhythms out of it yeah yeah haunting sounds. um but then act two would be you know everyone it's time to go home like let's get aggressive act two <laughs> Every project you're trying to make it is, is fresh and unique and, and something people haven't heard before. And it, it makes it really, really challenging, but also incredibly fun too, because you know, it's great to, to do crazy things that people haven't maybe haven't heard as much. And you get away with that like crazy in, in, in the horror genre. Having the creative freedom to be experimental, like no boundaries is so, it's so freeing on it, you know, especially with an instrument like this, like not many other projects would be cool with it. Knowing when to use those tools, I think it's key to sort of manipulating you know, the, the audience. I mean, it is just amazing the amount of audio and the amount of layers and the amount that the player feels like this is a real world. I think if we're able to connect to the point that we can make our players jump in their seats, we are on a good path. It's terrifying, but it's beautiful what they created, this world. I mean, I love the sci-fi outer space aspect of it, you know, and then the, the intimacy of the prison and all the stuff that happens within that and how they designed all that. To me, they created this world that is awesome and, and also very scary. I want the quality of the content that we're delivering to be on par uh, with any film.
Hopelessness and hopelessness usually go hand in hand. They both refer to an experience of being out of control. As a storyteller, it's important to ride that line between helplessness and hopelessness. Uh, you want your characters to be in the biggest pressure cooker situation possible. Where if you're the audience watching them, oh, you, you poor thing, how are you going to get out of this? Which is the essence of drama, you know? No, 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 no. No! But at the same time, you have to keep an element of hope in that story or you're gonna lose the audience. Come on, I can't. Yes, you can. We're almost there. I look at helplessness as a uh, physical condition. Helplessness, uh, I don't have enough ammo. I, I, don't, I, I don't have the right weapon. I, I don't know what to do here. It really should be a situation where, based on sort of scarcity of resources, that you feel like, you know, only by the skin of your teeth are you getting through every single encounter. But it is limited. There's a sense that this is uh, just the situation for now, and maybe there are ways that we could get out of the situation. You need to have even that little bit of spark of fight left in you, uh, no matter how dire things have become. Once you become hopeless, it, it, to me that sort of means like giving in. Hopelessness is very long-term. It is future-oriented. Hopelessness is despair. It's an emotion. And the best thing in a horror game is like, I have hope and then you dash it, right? You just, you just smash that hope. Callisto is not conducive to hope. That place is pretty hopeless. And if you're able to escape off Callisto, where are you escaping to? What, space? Space wants to kill you more than anything. So it's a, it's a very fine line to make sure that you're uh, keeping your characters as helpless as possible without falling into hopelessness. For me, you know, the humanity equals uh, the emotional investment that I have in the story or the script. You go to a movie to feel something, but you also go to identify with a character. Everything in fiction is all about relatability. So you can watch The Walking Dead and you can see zombies and know that zombies aren't going to ever happen. That's never going to be a thing. But the people in The Walking Dead that are dangerous, that they do encounter, that's very real. I mean, a lot of that stuff, you know, happens day to day. That's another thing that, you know, you can say humanity, but you can actually just replace that word with vulnerability. It's the most terrifying thing that there is. All of the characters within this game have something that you can relate to. They have a sense of humanity, and so you can actually care about them, you want to survive. And that's what drives you forward in the game and that's what hurts you when the brutal things happen or when you run out of resources and you get that anxiety and that fear. One of the things I think is interesting is how the main character starts to lose a little humanity as he has to progress, right? Like as he has to do things that he wouldn't normally consider himself doing. And as a player, you're playing this person not realizing, wow, look at the horrible stuff I'm gonna have to do to survive. <laughs> With the Callisto Protocol, one of the things that we were aspired to do was to tell a simple story with complex characters. We wanted to have characters that changed, that, that grew, that went on an emotional journey that, that you followed them along on. They came out the other side not quite what they were at the beginning. That's what people are going to relate with, I think, the most. They're going to be more invested in the characters and they're going to want to turn that scary corner and fight for what's right because they're invested in these characters. A big part of it is having characters that are that you can empathize with, that you can connect with, that you can feel their, their humanity, that at their core, there's a sense of sort of emotional realism built into the story. Most of the time on games, you don't know the entire plot. Every time we uh, uh, get to rehearsal, we um, go through uh, every single page of what we're going to work on for the next few days. And Chris and uh, Scott, they explain everything to us. Because we told the story in such 
it was so disjointed. You know, we'd shoot like the end of the game first, and then they they were sort of writing it as they went. They'd realize, okay, this works. We need to fix this. We need to, you know, amp this part of it up more. So you're constantly sort of, okay, what happened before this? And what are we doing? And he had, he was amazing at sort of, and, and Chris Stone, like sort of explaining where we were in the story. And so what we found sort of early on was that to really deliver the kind of scares and, 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 and intense feeling of terror that we wanted, it was critical that we have the foundation of strong characters and narrative to build on. This isn't about escape, Jacob. Not anymore. What's it about? Answers. Soon everything will become clear. The truth of Black Iron. The cast of the Callisto Protocol is by far the best cast I've ever worked with on any any project. We don't have a big cast, but they've all brought something to it. They all got into it. These are people that, that share our love for the genre and, and wanted to bring sort of an essential humanity and realism to the roles. To see a human being, especially portrayed by a very able actor like Josh, you empathize. You put yourself in that position. That actor is reminding you how terrified you'd be if you actually saw that. What would that be like if that was real? And a good actor like Josh can remind you and scare you <laughs> in ways that you're not prepared for. You know, Josh is someone that we were lucky enough to work with on previous projects. We love working with Josh. Josh was awesome. Are you kidding? He takes the script and he goes a little bit further. He adds his own humanity. He gets into the character so much that at some point he's going, well, this is the way he'd do it. I approach it like I do any movie. You know, I really try to be as emotionally invested and, and committed as I can, even though you're in these crazy, you know, mocap suits with a giant helmet and a camera looking you right in the eye. Max! Max! Let me go! What are you talking about? We see their performance because we capture everything at the same time on large mocap stages with cameras on the face. We get to see their entire performance. And I think you can see the quality of their acting come through. It's nice to be able to have people who have an imagination. For them to be able to kind of get themselves immersed in the scene while they're standing on a stage, it kind of asks something new of them. The creative team essentially created a playground for us. And for those who are not familiar, the performance capture stage is a bare warehouse. You don't have that many props. No costumes, no sound, no nothing. And you don't have any set around you. It's all make-believe sets. They take boxes and say, okay, this is a Jeep over there. This is the pipes stuck together. And that's the doorway into this crazy chamber. And there's 20 dead bodies and four monsters coming at you from the ceiling. So it's all about your imagination. So it makes it much harder. Open up! I love seeing Karen um, in, in the game because we're both actually huge fans of, of the, love boys. the boys. We love the boys. And suddenly, like, you know, seeing, seeing her in a full speaking role uh, <laughs> was, was, was fantastic. Karen brought a lot of energy, enthusiasm. This was the first time that Karen had worked in games. There's a learning curve that it takes, and she, you know, she learned very quickly. I remember the first day on set, I was in my full body motion capture suit with the dots on my face and a huge camera right here on a helmet. And it was kind of this weird out of body experience where I had to sort of relearn how to walk and talk and work with my surroundings. Very quick survey, right? See Danny down there. There she is. Right, hop down. Those things don't give up. We better get moving. You know, some of the other guys I hadn't worked with Sam Whitmer, uh, but you know, I had heard of him. Um, he's fantastic. That dude is crazy. Sam is one of the most committed actors I've ever seen. That guy is fearless. <laughs> Definitely mad. Capital mad. Sam is a guy that has worked obviously extensively in games and animation. He he understands this world top to bottom. He's also a guy that that loves coming in and playing. When you let a bunch of creative people 
show up and you trust that they have some ideas that maybe you haven't thought of and you let them push those ideas out there, provided you have someone who's really good at saying, no, 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 that's too much, um, you're gonna get some really interesting, unique stuff. Five, two, one. Me and you, we got some unfinished business. Yes, we do. <laughs> As you can see, things have changed. We go through, you know, a lot of efforts to try to immerse them in the scene as much as we can. As a performer, the creative team was amazing. They're very much about the rehearsal process, very much about like giving us as much previs as, as they can so that we understand the world, they understand what it's gonna look and feel like. We show them video reference, we play music for them sometimes, we show them imagery. They have artwork of all of the infected, scary, terrifying monsters. <laughs> and you get a little background on it and you understand that, okay, I'm a tough lifer prison dude. I don't stand a chance against that thing. So yeah, that, that environment of being in the, in the performance capture volume is, is unique, but I think it's a lot of fun. You go to a, a film right now and you're gonna sit there for two hours and you're gonna, you're gonna feel like you're kind of part of the movie, but you're always kind of a little bit detached. You're a viewer. You know, the difference with the game is, is, is you are, you are that character, right? You, everything you do, you have agency over what you're doing in that game and you have agency over the choices you make that create that story. You know, so the combination of just that interactive element and where technology is now with the graphics and the visuals and being able to get actual performances from actors versus just you know slapping someone's VO on top of some random person moving around. Those are, those are very different sort of experiences. Who did this and why? It's like someone's trying to cover up what's happening here. So what happened to the original colony? All in all, when you're done playing the Callisto Protocol, I hope that you look back on it and think to yourself, man, first of all, I had a lot of fun playing this game. I think the hope is that you kind of set down that controller feeling a little bit shaken, like you've gone on a journey. I want them to feel excited, scared, and have fun. I want them to do what I'm probably gonna do, which is flip it, turn it, and hit go again. I want them to walk away going, what a ride. Whew. I need a nap. I just can't wait for the fans to play it, and I can't wait to see everyone, uh, everyone's reaction to it. I want people to walk away and just go, that was a good, that was a good sci-fi horror game, man.